all of these cases, including uh, Tamara Leach and Chris Barber and all of all of the the people throughout the country who've been charged with mischief. Um, I feel like the the cases against them have been diminished somewhat. I'm not saying that they're no longer um, valid cases necessarily, but um, the Emergencies Act itself was found to be illegal. What is at stake? Are there freedoms that are being undermined by this prosecution, or I should say these prosecutions? Yes, absolutely. We are looking at the possibility of these men spending many, many, many years um, in jail for having an opinion and disagreeing with the current government. Publication ban remains in effect across the proceedings, so I'm still unable to discuss the occurrences, the happenings that are taking place within the courtroom. But I was fortunate enough to speak with a couple of interested parties, let's call them. One man named Stevlin came in from a great distance over in BC to observe the proceedings. And also a freedom activist, let's call her, named Shell, who's been very invested in the proceedings thus far and paying close attention to what's happening here and she was also attending the Coots protest and blockade itself. I got some great remarks from those two. Both Carbert and Olenek are being charged with conspiracy to murder. They're being accused of conspiring to murder RCMP officers. They're also being charged with weapons crimes and mischief over $5,000. We're running two online campaigns in relation to this trial. You can help fund Chris Carbert's defense costs if you go to helpchris.ca and make a donation. You can also help fund our in-the-field journalism that we're producing with Rebel News. I came in from Ottawa. I flew in economy, had to rent a car, got an economy Airbnb. We can't do this for free. We depend on your support to do these operations. So if you want to help us out, please visit truckertrial.ca and stay up to date with our ongoing coverage. So since I can't comment on the actual proceedings themselves, I want to share some interesting information that I came to learn recently that is germane or apropos or relevant to jury trials in general. It's this concept that I came to know as jury nullification. You folks can go and research that if you're so inclined. Now, what does jury nullification mean? It refers to a jury refusing to render a guilty verdict in a case where a defendant or defendants are technically guilty of the crime or crimes they're being accused of. More simply, it is when a jury refuses to enact or enable or enforce a law that they view as immoral. Now, let's elaborate on that. Jurors don't have anyone policing their minds when they enter their room for deliberations. No one can tell them what to do. No one can insert themselves into the jurors' minds. And the jurors can render verdicts based on their moral assessments. And if a jury views laws as immoral, or if they view the application of law as immoral in a particular case, they can refuse to convict. They can render a not guilty verdict. And in so doing, they can nullify a law in a de facto sense, or at least nullify the application of a law in a particular case or a series of cases, again, in a de facto sense. And this is something that Canadians and anyone who lives in a country with the history, the tradition of Anglo jurisprudence should understand because being selected for jury duty is something that any citizen can potentially embark upon. So remember, jury nullification means that jurors are not bound by the law as it is necessarily, they're bound by their own conscience and their own decisions themselves cannot be interrogated for rationale. One more point on this is that this jury nullification reality, this de facto scenario in which jurors, ordinary citizens, can override an unlawful or immoral legality, and remember, legality and morality are not synonyms, is a tremendous power that is bestowed upon citizens. And the more citizens know about this, the more armed they will be legally in executing their duties as jurors. And what this amounts to is a very powerful check on abusive or coercive governance. Because if a government gets out of control and is either imposing immoral, wicked laws or arbitrarily and selectively and abusively enforcing existing laws, 
The jury itself is a bulwark against that tyranny. One detail about the publication ban to explain its rationale is it is intended to protect the defendants, particularly to prevent contamination of the minds of potential jurors. Because right now in these preliminary hearings, there is a sort of arbitrage going on, a dispute over what types of evidence will be admitted and how or if not. So imagine, for example, that some evidence sought to be entered into the trial that's obtained by the Crown is either obtained unlawfully or illegally, or that the evidence itself has no veracity and is incorrect. You don't want that sort of information being disclosed publicly, which could potentially enter the minds of jurors and lead to them entering into contemplation to become jurors with preconceptions that are either incorrect or should never have been formed in the first place due to, again, unlawful acquisition of evidence or information. I spoke with some defense attorneys about this, and they say that, generally speaking, publication bans on preliminary hearings are reflexively requested by defense attorneys. So defense attorneys want this almost universally, and they have no problem with that in terms of protecting their clients' interests, at least insofar as the phase of the pretrial hearings that lead up to jury selection. Let's say you're a concerned inner citizen. Is that fair? That's very fair, yeah. And that's exactly what I am. And you drove in from Nelson, British Columbia, something like six-hour drive, 600 kilometers. Is that right? That's correct, yeah. Okay, now, Sevlin, why don't you tell our audience why the commitment? Why are you interested in this trial? Why does it matter? What should the audience watching know about what's at stake? Floor is yours. Well, that's a big question. Um, you know, when I started learning about this case, it was actually seeing people doing exactly, exactly this, having interviews in front of this courthouse. And I started to realize that a lot of the people were very articulate, obviously very caring people. And I thought, I thought these guys were supposed to be these horrible people that conspired to kill cops. And yet there's this juxtaposition of the people who are supporting them. They're actually like really kind hearted people. So it started getting me interested in learning more. And as I learned more, I started to realize that a lot of things about this case just really stink, um, let alone the fact that they have been held without bail for two years, uh, which when actual murderers in Canada get bail all the time, um, just yeah, made me, made me kind of uh, start to question our system. And um, I think getting back to your question, why it's important, it's not just the freedom of the two men who are still being kept in captivity, although that's really important, that's terrible, but it's also the fact that this case was used as one of the primary justifications of the Emergencies Act, and it's actually the last domino that hasn't fallen yet to continue justifying the Emergencies Act. So I feel like if, if and when um, Chris Carbert and Tony Oly Olynyk are found uh, innocent of these accusations. Not guilty. Not guilty, thank you. Um, I feel that uh, this will go a long way to ensuring that the abusive use of the Emergencies Act will not happen again. Okay, so Shell, I've seen you many days here during proceedings. You're obviously very interested and concerned about these proceedings, this trial. Why don't you tell us why it matters to you and why do you think it should matter to Canadians paying attention to what's going on with both Carbert and Olenek? So it matters to me because, um, well, I was in Coots for the full duration of the original convoy and blockade, and um, I stand behind and support them. I know they're innocent. I hope a jury will also find them innocent. Um, even better would be not getting to trial and mm -hmm. the truth coming out before then and them being released. That would be amazing. Um, so it's very important. Um, for us all to be aware of what's happening and the things that are happening is the overreach of the government um, with the emergencies act that was enabled uh, at the end of the uh, coots blockade that was found to be unlawful and there's other things that hopefully will also be found to be unlawful that our government is doing to repress its citizens and our rights and our voices and our thoughts Let's talk about the invocation of the Emergencies Act. We had this uh, Public Order Emergency Commission, this POEC. We also had, more importantly, this judgment by a federal justice named Richard Mosley, right. finding that the invocation of the Emergencies Act itself was unjustified or unconstitutional. It uh, violated constitutional freedoms and so forth. Do you think there's a connection between that and what's going on in this case? And if so, what is it? That's an excellent question. Um, 
I don't I don't really know of a connection other than the fact that all of these cases, including uh, Tamara Leach and Chris Barber and all of all of the the people throughout the country who've been charged with mischief. Um, I feel like the the cases against them have been diminished somewhat. I'm not saying that they're no longer um, valid cases necessarily, but um, the Emergencies Act itself was found to be illegal. The the prosecution of both Olenek and Carbert, maybe even we can include the Coots trio, you know, Marco Van Hugenboss, mm-hmm. uh, George Jansen, and Alex Van Herc. What is at stake? Are there freedoms that are being undermined by this prosecution, or I should say these prosecutions? Yes, absolutely. We are looking at the possibility of these men spending many, many, many years um, in jail for having an opinion and disagreeing with the current government. You can help fund Chris Carbert's defense costs if you go to helpchris.ca and make a donation. You can also help fund our in the field journalism that we're producing with Rebel News. I came in from Ottawa, I flew in economy, had to rent a car, got an economy Airbnb. We can't do this for free. We depend on your support to do these operations. So if you want to help us out, please visit truckertrial.ca and stay up to date with our ongoing coverage.